Since the start of Putin's invasion, the Russian leader has used nuclear rhetoric to threaten NATO allies and countries that support Ukraine. Putin's nuclear saber wrestling has caused an ease across the globe as potential nuclear attacks plague on the minds of the public. In reality though, the risk of any nuclear strike from a foreign nation is always incredibly low. Some military analysts have even commented that the risk of an attack has never exceeded 1% in recent years. We spoke to Professor Patrick Regan from the National Physical Laboratory at the University of Surrey about what the public can do to survive radiation from a nuclear strike in a worst case scenario event. My name is uh, Professor Paddy Regan. Um, I am the National Physical Laboratory Professor of Nuclear Metrology at the University of Surrey, and I'm also uh, the Department Head of Science in Medical, Marine and Nuclear at the National Physical Laboratory. And I'm um, sort of an expert in nuclear physics and radiation measurement and detection. We would like to preface this video by saying that the risk of any nuclear attack is always incredibly low. And this interview is focused on spreading information and causing any concerns or fears to the public. I think it's extremely unlikely that they would be used. Um, but we should be prepared, I suppose. And people people should be informed as well and informed sensibly um, about what the risks of such things are to them as individuals, which actually is, is almost significant, uh, insignificant. To start, we asked Professor Regan about what is the single most important aspect of surviving radiation caused by a nuclear blast. N nuclear weapons or weapons of fear, they don't actually, they don't kill people by radiation. Sorry, they don't ki kill people by nuclear radiation. The, the way that the, the lethal is from the blast and the fireball, the heat that they generate. Um, so we, we, we know from um, people being exposed to large amounts of, of radiation, full body radiation, we know how much energy you need to put into a human body for it to, to kill it or to cause lethal damage from uh, radioactive materials. And you can work out using a pretty, uh, pretty quickly that the amount of radiation you will be exposed to immediately from a nuclear weapon in order to get that that dose you would be so close to the weapon you'd be dead already you'd be killed by the blast and the fire so um if you're if you're outside of the survival zone and that's that's what a horrible term that is uh, that that depends on how explosive basically how big the bang is in terms of surviving a nuclear blast, as horrible as it sounds, the first thing you've got to do is not be anywhere near it or be far, far enough away that you're not killed in the blast or the fireball immediately that comes with it. And the blast means, you know, bricks, glass, you, everything in the way, just, you know, the most massive explosion you can imagine. The amount of radiation dropped by a nuclear bomb depends on two key variables, the size of the explosive and the height it was detonated. Professor Regan explains why the height of a nuclear explosion could impact how much radiation falls on the local area. In terms of in terms of the lethal aspects of what we call the radioactive fallout associated with nuclear weapons, that really depends um, at what altitude the nuclear weapon explodes at or is exploded at. So if it's if it hits the ground or if it's near the ground, it will cause a huge amount of well, we call it it'll induce radioactive material in the ground it will it will make the, the material that's in the ground radioactive throw it up into the fireball and drop it close close by or in a relatively close vicinity in, in you know ten, tens of miles hundreds of miles vicinity of where the weapon went off if the weapon is detonated and oh god theoretically i mean hopefully never but at a higher altitude um interestingly it has a bigger blast, so it does more damage immediately. But the radio, most of the, almost all the radioactive material just goes straight up into the troposphere, into the atmosphere, and circles around the Earth. It doesn't drop. There's very little, unless there's rain nearby. There's very little localized fallout. And we know that from nuclear weapons tests that have been done, um, four or five hundred nuclear weapons tests that have been done um, since the 1950s and 1960s. If, if, the, if the weapon is detonated close to the ground, we know this from, Fuku, from uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, or relatively close to the ground, there is some fallout, there's radioactive material. It, it, it is radioactive quite for a relatively short time. It, it, it's a whole mixture of different radioactive materials that, that come in that cocktail, um, all different fission fragments, but 
after about a month or two months, three months, there's only a couple of real strong signature gamma ray emitting radionuclides that are left. The thing about radioactive materials is as time goes by, they become less radioactive. Um, we call that the half-life. So the, the, the definition of a half-life in radioactive decay is how long it takes for the radioactive decay, the number of atoms that decay per unit time to drop by a factor of two. And just, just for clarification, that does, does not mean after two half-lives, it's all gone. It means after two half-lives, half of what you had left after one half-life still remains. So the amount of material drops away quite quickly. And once it's decayed, it's gone. It's like you fired the gun. It doesn't. It can't do any damage. It can't do any more damage then. But if you are, let's say, more than twenty miles away, as a, you know, you know, the effect is terrifying. I mean, you know, you you certainly see it. You don't want a nuclear weapon going off in your vicinity. But actually, the the radiation effects on you, as long as it doesn't rain on top of you and you're unlucky should be kind of small and what you should do is stay inside basically most advice from a variety of government websites advises that the public do four key steps when protecting themselves from nuclear radiation get inside remove your clothes and wash if you're outside after the explosion took place stay inside and wait for further information from the government most procedures advise that the public stay inside for a minimum of 24 hours but is 24 hours enough time for most of the radiation to subside a day is a good estimate, but a day would give people and people like me and people who work in university labs or school laboratories or hospitals or anywhere time to have radiation monitors and see what the gamma ray material, you know, see the rise in the uh, radioactive um, fallout. And we know this, we know this works. You can't hide these radioactive decays. They've got, they've got characteristic signatures. It's, it's basically light in a frequency that we can't see we call it we call it a gamma ray it's a gamma a gamma ray is a, a burst of light that your eye can't see but we've got special detectors that can pick up the energy that's characteristic for those particular radioisotopes and we know this works for example from the fukushima nuclear incident um in uh, 2011 i think um it, we could see we could see measurements of radioactive material coming past tokyo and we knew what the isotopes were um, and we could see that drop off pretty quickly in time. And we could say, state pretty categorically that the people in Tokyo were perfectly safe. There'll be all sorts of gamma ray monitors. All hospitals, well, in the world, basically, certainly in the UK, in the Western world, have, and, and the USA, have gamma ray monitors. They're used all the time for medical treatments and to check um, if people, um, people are treated with specific radioisotopes that actually come from fission fragments like technetium 99 that's a standard medical treatment hospitals are full of these detectors that can look for these signatures of of specific gamma ray radiation if you can see it's elevated because of a radio then you know you you stay inside till it's not elevated or at least it's down to a level that uh, is below the normal sort of background rate that we get from just living our everyday lives another part of most government's advice of surviving nuclear fallout is to take off your clothes and wash with soap if you have been outside after the explosion took place. This includes washing pets. We asked Professor Regan about why these precautions were in place and whether they'd actually be effective at protecting the public. The, the biggest possible concern is if you ingest, so there's different types of radiation that can hurt you. So gamma radiation is like light, light that just passes through you. That material is deeply penetrating. So if you if it's airborne and going around, that's, that's okay. If, you're, if it's outside the house, it's got to get through the walls. It doesn't get anywhere near you. The other sort of bad ones are beta and alpha emitters, and they dump a lot of energy, but in a very short range. So if they're outside your skin, or you put a, if they're on your clothing, they, they dump all their energy in, the, in, in your clothes or in the dead layers of your skin. They don't really do any damage to you at all. Um, the problem is if you ingest that material, if you get it next to a live cell, and it hits it, it will kill it. And horrifically, that that was that was a that's famous. A famous example of that is the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko in uh, the early sort of two thousands um, with polonium two ten. What about water that comes into your home from outside after the blast, from running taps that go directly into your home, and from water that is stored in your local area? Does this pose any risk? 
I would, I mean, if I was recommending it before, I'd drink water that was bottled before the explosion. I mean, or, or wine or beer or something. Something that was bottled before the explosion, you know, it's going to be pretty safe. Um, and maybe maybe then then get clearance from people who are actually measuring the, the drinking water before you start drinking the, uh, the local stuff again. Get an estimate at home. You could have a radiation monitor and stuff, but I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I would wait for the government to do it. The, it it's it's straightforward to do. I mean, if the signature is sufficiently high to be really of danger, it's very easy to pick out. It you know it, it'll be concentrated in water tanks, and you put your gamma ray detector next to it, and you see a big in your spectrum. You see a big line at um, either three hundred and sixty-five kV for. Um, ID 131 or, or, or 662 KV for 137 cesium. There are there are very clear signatures of what these gamma ray radiations would be. Um, and basically the, the size of the peak, the number of counts that you measure tells you how much of that radioactive material is there. And if it's at a trace amount or less than the normal activity that's in the water anyway, it's not a problem. Some advice calls for iodine pills to be taken to offer some protection from radiation. Professor Regan explains why these pills may be ineffective and fatal in their own right. I think as long as you don't eat it, the iodine, iodine, if you if you ingest radioactive iodine, it's particularly problematic for small children. Um, certainly, the the fallout from uh, from the Chernobyl disaster, the main disasters were for young people who got thyroid cancers, small children who got thyroid, most of whom survived. Actually, they were operating. They, most of them had radical uh, thyroidectomies and, and survived. So the way, the, the the reason that happens is iodine concentrates in the thyroid gland. And if you've got an excess of radioactive iodine, iodine 131, it will go to the thyroid gland, be concentrated in there, and it can induce a longer term. It can induce, there is evidence it can induce a thyroid cancer later on. Um, so the way thyroid pill, iodine pills work the way iodine pills work is you basically you block the uptake you 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 fill your thyroid with regular iodine before the bomb's gone off and then the body won't let you take any more iodine in i mean it's usually the first thing that people try and sell on the internet you know if there's a nuclear disaster buy iodine you know I, I i'm not a businessman but if i was i'd probably buy shares in iodines or us or something like that beforehand but i the the best way to avoid literally the best way to avoid ill health is drink bottled water drink canned eat canned food for the first bit after the incident then then you, you're kind of safe it's been sealed any contamination that may be there in the locality in the short term won't be in it um and after after time iodine iodine's got a half-life like i said of eight days or so so by the end of the month it's it's gone really though a bleak reality the main information to take away and Professor Regan's main point is that if you are far away enough from the initial fireball and the heavy shockwave from the nuclear explosion, the chances of survival are most likely very high and the fallout and radiation is likely to be very low. So um, I think if you're a long way away, um, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, the fallout is not stay inside for a bit, eat, eat, drink and be merry with your tin cans of, you know, your dinner beans and your can of, can of beer. Um, um, have a shower if you go out if you go outside have a shower you know probably don't open the windows immediately you know i'd wait for a um and then people will come outside and monitor very quickly what the radiation levels are if they're safe or not i mean you'll see very quick if the radiation levels really were lethal people would be dropping they'd be having scars on their skin from it's called it's called erythema it means basically skin reddening um uh, but that's that you're already at quite high levels of radiation to get to see that to get that and most people would get nothing like that at all you know the, 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 depending on if you if you as i said if you're close enough to really get large amounts of radiation dose um from a nuclear blast you're almost certainly in much bigger trouble because of the blast itself and the fire i mean i i, I sound flippant i mean these things are horrific uh, they they I, I in no way am i being light or, or thoughts about the, the, the thought of using these abominable weapons is terrifying. But that's what they are. They're, they're weapons of fear. That they're used as ultimate weapons of fear and you you just hope that 
um, the consequences of course of launching any, any sort of nuclear attack would be so so severe um, that it won't happen they, they, they wouldn't do it but uh, and then it just then then if if god forbid horrifically horror on horror if they were used it would depend on the size of the weapon and uh, so the size of the blast basically and ultimately whether the blast was on the surface or near the surface um, where there's going to be much bigger fallout localized radioactive fallout or at altitude where the blast will be worse but less radioactive fallout uh, but uh, you know these these are very unlikely and horror horrific nightmare scenarios so i would i would generally say to people you know, there are, don't don't worry about it. Basically, there are, the, you, the, your risks the, the, you're much more likely to you know much more likely to die in a car crash than you are of being exposed to radiation over the course of your life. Um, so uh, we can monitor radiation. We can monitor um, radioactive materials. Let's uh, just we and if they were used in horrible nefarious way, or they were used as some sort of dirty bomb or a terrorist incident or something like that. We can monitor very, very quickly what the levels are and we can tell people very quickly if it is safe or not safe. Mm -hmm.